When talking about Marxism, class is often one of the first things people bring up to argue that it might not apply as well anymore to the modern day first world capitalism as well as it did all those years ago when Marx was writing his critiques. I've always found the Marxist analysis of class difficult to apply to the present day. What's supposed to distinguish the bougies from the proles is that the bougies own the means of production and the proles work for wages. But what about a bartender who owns the bar she works in? What about YouTubers? Which side of the revolution are we on? I feel like a class analysis with only two classes must be overly simplistic. My favorite book about class in America is Paul Fussell's Class, a guide through the American status system, which describes nine distinct classes. This drifting away from Marxism is a great shame, because in reality, the Marxist analysis of class and capitalism is just as insightful and powerful today as it ever was. Even though society may look a lot different now, the core of the capitalism Marx wrote about is the exact same as the one we live under now. When we use crude interpretations of Marx's ideas to cast aside the theory as a whole, we handicap our own ability to analyse current society and draw meaningful observations from it. This Marx in Minutes episode hopes to dispel the notion that the Marxist class analysis is no longer relevant and lay out why it is still such a powerful tool at our disposal. Nowadays, we typically associate class with how much wealth somebody has. The higher your class, from lower to middle to upper, is basically just another way of saying how rich you are. And yeah, when you go by this, there is a lower, a middle, a lower middle, an upper middle, and a whatever else in between class. But when Marx talks about class, he means something slightly different. Because definitions within the theory of Marxism are designed to help us better express its more complicated ideas, which might not always fit in to what's colloquial. For example, in day-to-day -day speech, you and I might talk about weight and mass as if they were equivalent, because generally speaking, for us, they are. But if we were an astrophysicist trying to explain the theory of gravity, the distinction would be invaluable. That's why, in Marxism, class is used as shorthand to describe your relationship to the means of production, the means by which we as a society produce things, factories, tools, and land. When establishing these theories, Marx took two already popular terms for emerging groups within society, the proletariat and bourgeoisie, and characterized them within this notion of relation to the means of production, capturing two of the most typical relations we see within capitalism. The bourgeoisie own the means of production, and the proletariat do not, but are employed to work on them to produce goods which the owner may then sell on for a profit. There's a notion that Marxism attempts to capture all of society within these two specific categories, and thus simplifies it down to the most binary opposition. But even just going by this simple definition, there are tons of different ways that people can relate to the means of production. Marx himself even pointed out two different types of bourgeoisie, each comprising distinct classes, an industrial bourgeoisie and a landed property bourgeoisie, as these are two different relations to the means of production. Marxism doesn't make this grand statement that all of society fits neatly into two separate categories. In fact, it doesn't make many claims about the class composition of capitalism at all. In the book Capital itself, class is usually only referred to indirectly, acting as a backdrop to the more important mechanisms Marx was trying to analyse. Stuff like the wage relation, or the cycle and expansion of capital. It's from these fundamental features of capitalism, the way in which capitalism produces things, that the really powerful observations can come from. The fact is, is that there was never a time when society was neatly composed of just workers and just capitalists, like this imagined ideal of a burgeoning industrial society where gritty steelworkers were all employed by Mr. Monopoly. There have always been grey areas and outliers even when Marx himself was alive. In fact, arguably even more so than today, as Marx observed the transition from feudalism to industrialised capitalism. We no longer have any remnants of serfs, or a mercantile class, or an aristocracy, and so this idea that Marxism cannot deal with more nuanced situations like we supposedly have now because it's never had to face them is simply unfounded. But this all might sound quite surprising to some people. Are we really suggesting that class relations play a close to insignificant role within the Marxist framework? Is it not Marxism that claims all of society is merely a history of class struggles? That's right that it is, 
and it's true. But the key here is class struggle, not the incessant classification of every possible subclass within a society at a given time. Because where class really has its impact is not in its mere classification of people, but rather the class interests that define them. It's when these interests diverge that class struggle arises. The struggle to advantage one's own interest at, if need be, the detriment to another. So when we consider the unique conditions brought about by modern capitalism, rich movie stars who are technically wage workers or poor gig workers who technically own their own means of production, what's really important here is again, not their specific classification, but their class interest. And this is all Marxism really cares about. Throughout history, this confusion around what class is has been abused to actively make people work against their own class interests. But this is precisely why we need an analysis like Marxism to cut through this confusion, these layers sitting on top of the real matter of the issue, to aid us in identifying where our actual interests lie and how we can pursue them. But even with all of these microclasses and other grey areas constantly rising and dissolving again with the development of capitalism, there is still something significant to be said for this typical relation between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. They are the only elements guaranteed to reproduce themselves, no matter how much capitalism changes and evolves over time. And more so, it's the class relation between these two groups specifically which shapes how the features which make capitalism unique from previous societies manifest and operate. It's this relation that the rest of society revolves around, regardless of what other subtleties and class definitions may exist. And so you can think about all of these supposed outliers however you like. Because regardless, it doesn't actually affect the usefulness of the Marxist analysis. It doesn't touch on what makes it so powerful. That is, it shows what really underpins the dominant currents of social change. Class interest giving way to class struggle. The most primitive struggle within capitalism is just the confrontation between the haves and the have-nots, with each side always pushing for its own material interest. The clearest example in capitalist production is the wage relation. The owner, the capitalist who employs, wants the most amount of work for the lowest price, i.e. the lowest wage. The worker, the one who owns nothing but their ability to labour, wants the opposite, the least amount of work for the highest price. But this seemingly simple situation begs the question, who actually quote, wins this struggle? How is any kind of equilibrium maintained, especially when the sides are so unbalanced? The owners are a natural minority, and the ownerless a majority. So how could owners ever hope to maintain what they actually own? Imagine for a moment naked aggression on both sides of this class struggle. In the wage relation, what duty does the worker have to simply hand over the goods they have created that day through the use of the capitalists' tools? Why can't they take the fruits of their labour for themselves and sell them just as the capitalist intends to do already? Or perhaps on another typical front for class struggle, that between the landlord and the tenant. What could the landlord do if a tenant, or a group of tenants, simply decided to stop paying rent? There's no hope that any class-based relation we're so familiar with today could ever hope to be maintained over time if the struggle between these two groups of diametrically opposed interests was allowed to play itself out. The bourgeois solution to this problem is the state. As summarised by Engels, In order that these antagonisms, classes with conflicting economic interests, might not devour each other and society in sterile struggle, a power seemingly standing above society becomes necessary for the purposes of moderating the conflict, keeping it within the bounds of order. And this power, which has arisen out of society but placed itself above it, is the state. It is the state that maintains existing class relations, and by extension, the wider mode of production itself. The state is a controlled battleground for opposing class interests to confront one another. It mediates the peaceful reconciliation of opposing interests for the benefits of perpetuating capitalism. This is an important framing, because the state isn't just used by capitalists to oppress workers, although make no mistake, it certainly is. It is also obviously a frontier on which workers can make gains against the capitalists through welfare and general reform, 
These are back and forth struggles which are inevitable under capitalism, but require a state in order to be sustainable. The specific tools which comprise the state are different from society to society. Under capitalism specifically, they are generally comprised of a judicial system to define and enforce the property rights capitalism needs to survive, the media to redirect antagonisms of class struggle to other issues which divide the workers among themselves, schooling to condition and discipline new generations for a capitalist workday, and the police force to act as a special body of armed men to maintain control of a minority over a majority. These are of course quite sweeping statements, and immediate objections may be that it's unfair to define all of these institutions on this basis alone, when they carry out so many vital functions. Schooling educates, the media informs, and the police keep peace. But Marxists never try to claim that this is impossible, but rather it is along class lines which determine how these vital social functions manifest, and the most fundamental purpose which they serve. The police, for instance, keep the peace in society, something we all agree is needed in some way. But this is something society has needed since its inception. It's only the preservation of capitalist private property rights which is specific to capitalism, and so it is reasonable to define the police along these lines when, being only a couple hundred years old, it is their only unique characteristic. Further confusion can be introduced when these institutions are not explicitly an arm of the state. The media, for instance, at least in the West, is mostly privately owned, and so surely is not a part of the state. But it does not need to be in order to carry out its functions as a tool of class struggle. The private police force of Ankapistan is a police force all the same. So, the array of tools which make up the state change to suit the class which currently wields it and the mode of production under which it exists. This begs the question then, what forms do these tools take when the workers control the state and the mode of production is communism? A worker state is often referred to as a dictatorship of the proletariat, with capitalism of course being a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. This worker state does take on a unique set of tools and apparatus used to maintain its new, inverted position of class control over society, and this will be explored in detail in a separate video. But this itself is not communism. Communism is a classless society, where each person's relation to the means of production is the same as anybody else's. Communal ownership. And if the state is a tool of class struggle, then a state in a Marxist sense is impossible, because no such struggle takes place. The dissolution of this worker's state as communism is birthed from the remnants of capitalism open up new freedoms for wider society at the most individual level, freedoms impossible to observe under the pretext of antagonistic and struggling interests. Hopefully, this episode in Marx and Minutes has laid out what the Marxist conception of class is and why we would do well to continue to use it in analysing and reasoning about society today. Marxism does not posit two idealised conceptions of an owner and a worker. It takes the most fundamental elements of capitalism, those class interactions which are core to its continued existence, and explains how these influence society as we see it today. Marxism will only be outdated when capitalism itself ceases to perpetuate. <laughs>